Hi guys, how are you all doing? This is going to be a very quick one. <laughs> Mr. Obi said the Bible is complete. The Bible is complete. That is the biggest joke of the millennium. In, in fact, it's the biggest joke of all time. <laughs> Bible is which complete. You see, you've got my, my problem with a lot of people is you don't want to admit that the men that put this book together were humans who are prone to error. And if today their miscalculations with the level of technology we have, imagine 4,000 years ago. Let me break your heart. There's no original book of any of the books of the Bible. There's no original Deuteronomy, original Genesis, original Revelation. None. It's just copies of copies of copies of copies. And over time, we found that some copies are more accurate than others. Some manuscripts are more accurate than others. No original manuscript of any biblical book in the canon exists today. Prove me wrong. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. I thank you for your wisdom, and I thank you for giving us understanding. I ask that your truth be revealed to us, and I ask that we understand this truth, and we use this truth to grow ourselves into better people. In Yahushua's name I pray. I was having a conversation with Vic earlier on today, and um, I made a statement. I said, uh, King James was the first Bible. And Vic said, ah, you made, I said, oh, sorry, I meant to say the Geneva Bible was the first English translation. And Vic said, no, 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 even the Geneva Bible was not the first translation. It was Tyndale's Bible. I always thought that Tyndale never translated a complete Bible. In my opinion, the books of Tyndale I saw were like parchment. So I felt that, ah, did Tyndale actually, was he able to get to translate a whole Bible? And the answer is yes, about a hundred years before King James, which puts him about 50 years even before the Geneva Bible, which I always assumed was the first, well, okay, okay, yeah, uh -huh. the Geneva Bible was the first authorized Bible. The Tyndale Bible was never authorized. It was a, um, like a black market Bible. These are the conversations I like to have with people who are deep thinkers. But when you come and say the Bible is complete, you know, yesterday we had a we had a discussion. I brought up David and Elkanah. Elkanah. Who killed Goliath? There were two different versions. And I said, you see, when you have contradictions like this, it's hard for you to run to the Bible. You also have to run to history. You have to run um, to logic as well. You have to be able to identify what is a true story and a myth. If Nigerian students were to write a Bible, they will write about Madame Koi Koi. A hundred years from now, Madame Koi Koi will become a reality because one, all one person needs to do is assert that what he imagined to be was true. Now, let's leave. You see, when I raised that, people were insulting me. People came into my um, the DMs. We went public. One particular guy went on the comment section. Listen to this guy. He went on uh, my comment section and tried to sound intelligent. You know? He said... Uh, Okay. He said, Daddy Freeze, uh, I, uh, he wrote all about that the Bible wasn't contradictory. I said, the Bible is contradictory. How did Judas die? How come Matthew 27 and Acts chapter 1 have contradictory explanations? And who even reminded me of this? It was my beautiful daughter, Marachi, called from. She said, come, how did Judas really die? Because I'm reading two different things here. I said, yeah, hey, hey, Marachi, you are right. <laughs> As you are reading the two different things, actually two different things. And the guy went on to say something. He said, the potter's field was bought with the money Judas returned after he hung himself. He died while hanging himself and he must have fallen in the process. 
He must have fallen. The, were you there? You are assuming. The Bible didn't say he fell. From, wait, have you not seen this? Right now, go to Linda Ikeji's blog. Somebody's there hanging near a police station. Read that. Look at that picture and then read Acts chapter 1 and see whether it aligns with that description. Read Matthew chapter 27. Real quick, let me do this with you. Well, I have your time today, even though it's just 15 minutes. Real quick, go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 27. I'm reading from verse 4. I have sinned, declared Judas. For I have betrayed an innocent man. What do we care? They retorted. That's your problem. Then Judas threw the silver coins down in the temple and went out and hung himself. The leading priest picked up the coins. One, they first picked up the coins. It wouldn't be right to put this money in the temple treasury, they said, since it was the payment for murder. They discussed it. After some discussions, they finally decided to buy the potter's field and they made it into a cemetery for foreigners. That is why it is still called the field of blood. Now let's go to Acts chapter 1. Let's go there. It's, it's us today. We, we discussed this. Someone said, I've been waiting for this since. Hey, I didn't keep you waiting. We're only a few minutes gone. Acts chapter 1, please open it up. Verse 12, uh, in fact, no, verse 18, let me jump. Judas had bought a field with the money he received for his treachery, falling head first there, his body split open, spilling out his intestines. The news of his death spread to all people in Jerusalem. Judas had bought a field, really? Judas threw the money on the floor and went and hung himself. Matthew 27 is clear. Then the priest, the leading priest, now took the money, discussed, they said after some discussions, it wasn't just one discussion, it was a bit of discussion, they finally agreed that, you know what, we're going to use this to buy the potter's field. So how can you say Judas bought it? Judas that had gone and... So these are two contradictory, um, uh, what is it called? explanations of the same instance and when you now say they will now say eh, when you hang yourself you fall that is how it, you see when you who remembers some muslim gentleman called ahmed did that when you go and say something like this in front of ahmed did that he will laugh at you that kind of thing what do you do you admit that yes there's a inconsistency and you blame it on translation if i were having this discussion with a muslim i'd say look the Bible is 500 years. The Christian um, story is 500 years older than the Islamic one. And there is a high level of possibility that there will be inconsistencies in accounts. Now, how valuable is that account? Of what purpose? Okay, yes, we know Judas had to be replaced. But who really cares what they did with them? The money, it's, is it that important? Is it something that we should sweat over? The answer is no, but I'll admit because that's an inconsistency. Now, all these are still small. Let me give you Genesis chapter 32 verse 30. Let's quickly open it up. Let's read it together. Genesis chapter 32 and verse 30. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means the face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. He has seen God face to face and his life was spared. Okay. Now let's check another scripture. Exodus chapter 33 and verse 11. 
Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord will speak to Moses face to face as one will speak to a friend. Afterwards, Moses will return to the camp, but the young man who assisted him, Joshua, son of Nun, will remain behind in the tent of meeting. So Jacob saw um, God face to face and named the place Peniel, after, uh, which means face of God. Moses in Exodus chapter 33 verse 11 also saw God face to face. And then, let's read John chapter 1 verse 18. Open it up. No one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. Let's read it in the New, Living, in New International Version. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is the closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Is this an inconsistency in the report? Now, because I teach the free nation that the red Bible comes first. The red Bible is the words of Christ. This is, although not the word of Christ, a reporting of the life of Christ. So I will take this over Exodus, which was written many years ago, and there could have been errors i'll take this over josh over um jacob's instance i'll take this over moses instance but whether you like it or not this is a clear contradiction no one's ever seen god but jacob saw god and moses saw god but no one saw god i'll take the christ one i'll say okay you know what no one saw god but i know there's a inconsistency i just choose to follow Christ. I'll give you another example. Let's talk about Abraham. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 25. Bring out your calculator. Let's calculate this together. Someone said, where do you get these inspirations from? From seeking the spirit of God. Once you start seeking the spirit of God, he will fill you with his truth. And the moment you agree that the Bible is complete, that means you are, comp you are putting God inside a book that was canonized by man. Let's, let's, let's read this. 28, uh, sorry, 26, Genesis eleven twenty six, 26. And Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. What does this mean? It means... Tara was 70 years old when he gave birth to Abraham. Can I read it again? Let me read this again to you. And Tara lived 70 years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haram. Right? So Tara was 70 years old when he gave birth to Abraham. Right? Let me show you another scripture. Genesis eleven thirty two. Now let's read Genesis eleven thirty two. And the days of Terah was two hundred and five years old, and Terah died in Haran. So if Terah was two hundred and five years old, how old was Abraham when Terah died? I'm asking you, we did the math. How old, I'm not going to go further because I asked you to bring out your calculator. The Bible clearly says Tara was 205 years old when he died. So if Tara gave birth to Abraham at 70, how old was Abe? This is a primary four mathematics question. Tara died at 2.05. Tara was 70 years old when he gave birth to Abraham. How old was Tara? How old was Abraham when Tara died? So somebody said 135. 135. Oh, mathematicians, you have brain. 
Okay? Now let's read Genesis chapter 12 and verse 4. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 4. Sorry, I'm waiting for my scriptures to load. So Abraham departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran. Now let's remember, Abraham left Haran when Terah died. Let us also read again from the book of Acts chapter 7 and verse 4. Acts 7 verse 4. Let's read this, Acts chapter 4. So, Ab so he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran after the death of his father. God sent him to this land where you are now living. So, Abraham was 75 when he left Haran. That was after Terah died. Tara was 70 years older than Abraham, meaning Tara could not have been more than 145. But guess what? Tara was 205 when he died. Now, this inconsistency here could be with the way they numbered days. It wasn't, you see, today you have a calculator, you can multiply 252,345,155.78. You can multiply it by 1,201,735 uh, and get if those days, numbering was not as straightforward as it is today. So yes, there could have been a possibility of somebody miscalculating somewhere. And because these books were never, the, the original manuscripts were never found, scholars had to make do with what they have. But whatever you are saying, you can clearly see that here you have an inconsistency. Somebody cannot be 70 years older than somebody. And then the person dies at 205. And then the person is 70. Let's continue. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3 to 5. The beginning of the Bible. The book of Genesis. Simply Vic sent me a message. You cannot do this in one day. Of course. The errors and inconsistencies. We are not even talking of King James now. We are just talking of general Bible. Genesis chapter 1 verse 3. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. So, in the beginning, God created the light. Now, which is the first day, God created the light on the first day. Now let's read Genesis chapter 1 verse 14. Then God said, let the light appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them be signs to mark the seasons. Let these lights in the sky shine down on the earth. And that is what happened. God made two great lights, the larger one to govern the day and the smaller one to govern the night. He also made the stars. So God created the sun according to this instance, on the fourth day, but he already created light and darkness on the first day. Now, this needs an even deeper understanding. That is why in the beginning, 
I believe the light that was created was the light of Christ, the light of Lucifer, the light bringer. And then the darkness was the darkness of evil. But you see, it's still contradictory, no matter how you try to explain it, because it says, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. There must be something else in here that did not make it to the Bible. Because what separates the day and the night is the sun. The sun is what separates the day and the night. There's no argument about it. And guess what? The sun was not created until four days later. So it's either God was talking on the first day. He created metaphorically light and darkness. And then human beings and they're trying to understand it just separated it day and night. Because then they, they didn't understand that you can't have day without the sun or night without the sun. The night is absence of the sun, day is presence of the sun. So whether you like it or not, there's a clear contradiction here. And the, con the confusion does not come from God. It comes from the people who wrote this book under the inspiration of God, but lacking in understanding. I'll take you a little further again. Genesis chapter 1 verse 20, 21. Genesis chapter 1, verse 20. Then God said, let the water swarm with fish and other life. Let the sky be filled with all kinds of birds. God created the great li living sea creatures and every living thing that scurries and swarms in the sea. So, the fourth, after the fourth day, the fifth day, God now created the birds right there. Verse 21, God created every sea creature and every living thing uh, and every sort of bird on the fifth day, right? Now go with me and read. Okay, now when did God create man? Verse 26. And evening passed and morning came making the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth produce every sort of animal, livestock, blah, 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 blah. Then God said, after he had done all this, then God said, let us make human beings in our own image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, livestock, blah, 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 blah. Now let's read Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then God formed man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils and the man became a living person. Then verse 19 on that same line. Then God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper who is just like him. So the God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. Then he brought them to the man. So in Genesis chapter 2, God made man first and then he formed the animals and brought them to man. It could be a translational issue. It could also be the fact that the complete Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 have never been found. And scholars try to, the, 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 the scrolls, the original, the closest to original of the scrolls that they had, had little holes here and there with words missing. So scholars try to fill in those words with the words they considered best suited. Go with me a little further. Let's discuss the Amalekites. 1 Samuel chapter 15, 7 to 8. 1 Samuel chapter 15, 7 to 8. Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to shore. Sorry, I'm reading King James. 
Let me read from another by uh, Samuel 15, 8. Let's start from 7. Then Saul slaughtered the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the Amalekite king, but completely destroyed everyone else. Completely destroyed. Absolutely. In totality. Totally. Someone said, it's not a mistranslation. The Bible described two separate creations. May God bless you, but I didn't want to go there. Because in the beginning, God created man and woman in chapter 1 in his own image. And in chapter 2, the man was now lonely. But I didn't want to go there because I don't want to talk about any Lilith or any extra canon books. Because you will now say, ah, it's not. Let's use the Bible. So let's leave the other theories and let's face this one. So, verse, 1 Samuel 15, verse 8, he destroyed everything completely. You know what it means? He saved only the king and destroyed everything completely. To verify this, we can also read verse 20. But I did obey the Lord, Saul insisted. I carried out the mission he gave me. I brought back King Ahab, but I destroyed everyone else. So meaning that there were not supposed to be any Amalekites. Okay. Now let's read 1 Samuel 27 verse 8. 1 Samuel chapter 27 and verse 8. David and his men spent time raiding the Geshurites, the Gerizites, and the Amalekites, people who had lived near Shur towards the land of Egypt since ancient times. David did not leave one person alive in the villages he attacked. He took the sheep, goats, cattle, donkeys. David still killed Amalekites that were destroyed completely. Okay, let's even imagine that they left some. At least David as cuckoo destroyed him completely again. At least David's kingship was after Saul. So you can clearly tell that this narrative is after the Saul destroying the, narr the Amalekites narrative, right? Okay. First Samuel chapter 30 verse 1. Three days after David and his men arrived home at their town of Ziklag, they found that the Amalekites had made a raid. Amalekites again? <laughs> Saul killed them completely. David killed them totally. And they are still here. Then David and his men arrived home, the town of Ziklag, they found that the Amalekites had made a raid. And they carried off the women and children and everyone else, but without killing anyone. Then read verse 17 and 18 again. David and his men rushed in among them and slaughtered them throughout that day and the entire night until evening. None of the Amalekites escaped except 400 young men who fled on camels. Some people where Saul killed completely, David killed completely, they still killed them again, still remain 400. Obviously, someone telling this story made errors. Now, before I go any further, I want to ask you, are these not inconsistencies? Please answer me. First 
1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 10. Let's go there. 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 10. When you're there, let me know. In the same way, all seven sons of Jesse were presented to Samuel, but Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. So Samuel had, sorry, Jesse had seven sons that went before him, before David. Then Samuel said, are these all the sons you have? There is the youngest, Jesse replied, but well, he's out in the fields watching the sheep and the goats. So, clearly, Jesse had seven sons apart from David. Let's read, let's go to the next chapter. Chapter 17 and read verse 12. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and read verse 12. Now David was the son of a man named Jesse, an Ephratite, from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. Jesse was an old man at that time. He had eight sons. He had eight sons. Verse 13. Jesse's three oldest sons, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shimea, had already joined Saul's army to fight the Philistines. David was the youngest son. David's three oldest brothers stayed with Saul's army. So clearly it mentions eight sons. First Chronicles chapter 2 verse 13. First Chronicles chapter 2 verse 13. When you're there, let me know you're there. Sorry, network is hanging. Just be patient. <laughs> someone, someone said they had a battlefield. So completely simply means all the soldiers were there. Are you giving me your, your assumptive understanding or you are quoting the scripture? Say, don't you know what the meaning of completely means? Stop, stop showing how senseless you are by raising stupid arguments. Don't you know what totally means? Don't you know what absolutely means? Saul said he killed everyone except the king. You are telling me he killed all the soldiers. Everyone, did you read what God says you do, including women and children? You think you are talking to your pastor? You think this is your geo that went to seminary of Malachi 3 8 to 10? I'm telling you something, you are there trying to defend yourself. The obsidian, or the please, 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 let me not block you because I'm not very patient with people who are ignorant. I'm not patient with them. Something is clearly contradictory. You are there arguing. Please go with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 13, Jari, the rest of you. How many sons did the Bible say uh, Jesse had? The Bible said he has eight sons, Abi. Verse 13. Jesse's first son was Eliab, his second was Abinadab, his third was Shimea, his fourth was Nathel, his fifth was Radai, his sixth was Ozem, and his seventh was David. Where is the eighth one? Baba, you will argue saying he did not kill the Amalekite. Okay, where is this eighth son? Read First Chronicles Chapter 2 from verse 13. Let me read it to you again. Jesse's first son, one, Eliab. Second son, two, 
Abinadab. Third son, Shimea. Fourth son, Nathanael. Fifth son, Radai. Sixth son, Ozem. Seventh son, David. Where's the eighth son? Come and argue now. Show me you, Sabi, argue. Come and argue. You don't quiet now. Your body don't calm down. Clearly, the scripture said he had eight sons. Someone is saying we need patience. I understand that you need patience to understand. But don't, I don't, I, one thing I hate, and I see this from religious people, you are clearly seen with a contradiction. Instead of you to say, I'm coming, I want to go and check the original scriptures. I want to talk to some rabbis. I want to do some research. You now start to try to defend the thing that is inconsistent in the first place. Eh, it must be that. I don't give you one now. Bible clearly said there were eight sons. One even mentioned the word eight. They mentioned seven of the sons and gave all their names. Where is the eighth one? Let's read 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 10. Second Samuel chapter 24, verse 10. But after he had counted the census. After he had taken the census, David's conscience began to bother him. He said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly by taking the census. Please forgive my guilt, Lord, for doing this foolish thing. Okay? David admits that he sinned in taking the census. First Kings chapter 15 verse 5. For David had done what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and had obeyed the Lord's commandment throughout his life, except in the affairs concerning Uriah the Hittite. So the only place where David sinned was Uriah the Hittite. What happened to the censors that God got upset for? Now, you are quoting uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. Um, God is not the author of confusion. The word wasn't confusion. King James was the one that translated confusion. I'm going to get to that. You know what? In fact, preach that sermon there. I allow you to preach it. Or better still, let me even answer you so that I can go and rest. The Greek word that was used in 1 Corinthians 14, 33 was akatastasius. It does not mean confusion. It means disorder. Meaning God is an orderly God. King James translated nonsense to confusion. It's not confusion. It's disorderliness. Disorderliness does not mean confusion. So finally, 
I want to go and join Taze Buds. Please do come and join us. We can all agree now that there's so many human errors, errors of parallax, errors of mistranslation, errors of misunderstanding history, numbering errors, all sorts of errors that have made our holy book seem contradictory. And it must be contradictory because it was not written by the hand of God. It was inspired by God, but written by man. Man's flaws, man's, the fact that man is incomplete must show through his work. So yes, it is actually a blessing to mankind that the Bible is incomplete because the word of God cannot be contained by a man. It cannot be canonized by a man. So yes, there are errors in the Bible. The Bible is nowhere near complete. There are, there are errors into the thousands. But here it is. May God open the minds of our understanding and may he lead us to all truth as he has promised to give us the Holy Spirit which will lead us to all truth because the Holy Spirit Numa Ton Alethia the Spirit of Truth. God bless you. Please join Taste Buds youtube.com forward slash Taste Buds NG and uh, taste buds ng on instagram take good care of yourselves guys see you tomorrow in church 11 a.m don't miss it